so much for coming along. Uh, my name is Dr. Daryl Stump, and I'm an archaeologist with the University of York. And thanks so much for coming to um, uh, hear a talk from uh, John today. Uh, the intention is, our intention is to be quite informal. So John's going to give a, a short talk, then John and I are going to have a conversation, and we'd like love to open this up to the audience for questions from you. So whilst John is talking, and whilst John and I are talking, do think of interesting questions that you'd like to put to John. So, as I say, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, John Parker. John taught at uh, taught African History at SOAS, so that's the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London from 98 until 2020. He's the author of Making the Town, Gar State and Society in Early Colonial Accra, um, uh, Tonaga, uh, The History of a West African God, and African History, A Very Short Introduction. And most recently, he's edited the volume that we're here to celebrate and hear about today, which is Great Kingdoms of Africa. So, over to you, John. Thanks so much, Daryl, and thank you all so much for coming out on what was a, a glorious evening, I suppose, with two Lancashire teams competing on the FA Cup. You might as well uh, listen to a bit of African history and take your mind off it. Um, when I was initially approached by Thames and Hudson to produce a book for a general readership on the history of Africa, I was initially reluctant to do so. Some years earlier, Thames and Hudson had had some success with a book called Great Empires of Asia, and they were keen to uh, have a companion volume on Africa. In part, my hesitation was due to the value judgment implicit in this rather old-fashioned concept of great empires. Like I suspect most historians and other scholars, I considered that my job was not, was not to consider if anything historical was great or not, but to recover, interpret, and to teach the past in all its complexity and nuance. Neither was I comfortable with the concept of great empires leaving aside the matter of whether they could be described as great or not, I wasn't convinced that the sort of expansive imperial states that we've seen in the history of Asia and Europe were also a central and recurring feature of the African past. Now, across time, Africa, of course, as we'll see, did have some large and very impressive imperial state systems. And it certainly had a lot of great kingdoms whose power and reach sometimes expanded to a phase of imperial rule over neighboring peoples. But the real thrust of academic scholarship in the last generation or so has not really been to think about how great kingdoms have been, but to demonstrate that African societies were often highly effective in stubbornly resisting the efforts of would-be state builders to impose control over them, both in the deep past before the coming of European rule, in the so-called colonial period, and in the post-colonial period of African independence from around 1960. Many African peoples, that has worked out very sophisticated ways to govern themselves in relatively egalitarian, small-scale communities, and thereby avoid or limit the overweening efforts of people to impose power over them. The hierarchies that emerge, the inequalities that emerge, and the exploitation that is often associated with large states. On reflection, however, I concluded that the gap between how academic historians like me perceived the African past and how, if at all, Africa was perceived by the general reading public, whether positively or negatively, was one worth trying to bridge. Indeed, given recent debates about the decolonization of the past, about the ongoing legacies of the transatlantic slave trade and of European imperial rule in Africa and elsewhere, and in light of ongoing racial injustice exemplified in the Black Lives Matter movement in the last five years or so, a better understanding of the deeper African past, I thought, was of great importance. The result is the book I want to talk about tonight, Great Kingdoms of Africa. Despite the shift in the focus of academic research away from political history towards more social and cultural history that I've noted, we've taken as our theme African kingdoms. 
as there remains, I think, very important questions to raise, in part generated by those intellectual shifts about the nature and dynamics of kingship. And by that phrase, I also include queenship in many important cases uh, in the deep past of the continent. The book opens with a chapter by the archaeologist David Wengro on the roots of kingship in Africa's earliest states in the ancient Nile Valley, both Egypt and Nubia to the south, which begins with a clear statement of one of these key issues. History, Wengro writes, is often written as a story of the rise and fall of kings. But the history of kingship in Africa, as elsewhere, is shaped as much by the people kings governed as by the varied nature of kingship itself. This theme threads its way through the following eight chapters in the book. So what we try to do is think not just about how kings ruled kingdoms, but about the interaction between states on the one hand and societies on the other, and the kind of dynamics, both productive and often less productive, that arose from that relationship. The chapters extend across time and space from the ancient Nile Valley to the sequence of imperial states in the savannah, or so-called Sedanic zone of West Africa, the ancient Christian kingdom of highland Ethiopia, the forest kingdoms of West and Central Africa, and the Great Lakes regions of East Africa, and on to two very striking state-building projects in the 19th century, the Sokoto Caliphate uh, in present-day northern Nigeria and the famous Zulu kingdom in present-day South Africa. The book that is, is about a crucial aspect of the 5,000 year history of Africa, uh, recorded history of Africa before the period of European conquest and colonial rule from the late 19th century, about which most African historians today are researching on. There's far less uh, effort being put into researching this much deeper uh, African past. It seeks, therefore, to move the popular understanding of the continent's past beyond the violence and the exploitation of the slave trade and of European imperial rule in a way that is learned but engaging and accessible to a general readership. I was concerned, too, for the authorship of the chapters to be reflective of the increasing diversity uh, within academia today. Most, therefore, are written by up-and-coming younger African scholars, many of whom uh, have roots in the regions that they're writing about. Let me now just set out a few more of the main ideas that emerge from the book's nine case studies. I've got about five or ten minutes to do that. We're not going to be able to go into any great detail, but my hope is that uh, Daryl and I will pick up on some of these ideas and I hope I can draw uh, you into with your questions as Daryl mentioned. The first point to note about these case studies is that they are representative of the history of state building in Africa across time. The continent has had hundreds of uh, kingdoms and has seen the rise and decline of many state formations and many types of state formations, great and small. And no one book can cover them all. It is therefore about great kingdoms of Africa and not the great kingdoms of Africa. I've looked at a few reviews of the book already and inevitably the reviewers say, well, why can't there have been a chapter on X, Y, or Z? Um, my own feeling is the book's quite long enough as it is. So. Um, the representative nature of it is important. Those examples that do feature, however, such as so the Sudanic empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songo, Ethiopia, the Yoruba kingdoms, Benin, Congo, Ashanti, Buganda, and others, have some of the richest historical traditions, both oral and written, something we can come back to later in terms of thinking about the sort of sources that are used for this research and have attracted extensive historical research. And this, I think, allows for a degree of comparative perspective, both within Africa and beyond it. And this, for me, is crucial, because what 
I'd like the book to demonstrate is that the African past should be considered on its own terms, but also needs to be considered in a comparative way next to the histories of other continents. African kingship, I think, and the history of the kingdoms that emerge from it have very important things to say when, brought, when they're brought into dialogue with the history of uh, kingdoms in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. So, in Africa, as elsewhere, one key question for historians has been a deceptively simple one. What is a king? What makes a king or a queen? What distinguishes kings and queens from ordinary people? We think we know that. The answer seems quite self-evident, but once you start thinking about it, it's not. The dynamics with which certain people are created to be kings and the dynamics with which power is accumulated and maintained and re over the centuries uh, is, is an interesting one and I think uh, there's much of interest in the African past that can be brought into that comparative perspective. To quote from the introduction of the book, do dynastic rulers forge their own power as autonomous actors or are they created by wider social structures and processes? Are kings and queens predators or are they peacemakers? Do they rule by coercion or consent? How, in the words of one important uh, study on uh, kingship over the centuries, how are people persuaded to acquiesce to a polity where the distribution of power is manifestly unequal and unjust as it invariably is? Now, of course, there's no single or simple answers to these questions. And it's important to note that Africa's diverse peoples have long debated them themselves and experimented over the centuries with different forms of government. But there is much evidence that kingship in Africa was originally, and in many ways has remained, essentially a sacred institution. And this is not just the case in Africa, as we saw recently with the coronation of Charles III, with the mystical and ritual anointment, which of course was seen to be so mystical, us ordinary people weren't even allowed to watch it. It happened beyond a screen in a hidden or occluded fashion. So these mystical accoutrements that underpin power are not exclusive to Africa. We see them in British kingship and kingship elsewhere, but they have taken on interesting forms over time that's worth thinking about. Kings, that is, laid a claim to sacred power, and if not often seen as divine beings like the Egyptian pharaohs were seen, they were seen to have certain mystical, otherworldly, and I use this term advisedly, str or strange powers. Kings are strange. Why they're strange and how they maintain that strangeness to us is, I think, an important historical question. These mystical values of kingship were typically seen to be directed to the preservation of fertility, health, prosperity, peace, justice, and the ancestral social order, often symbolically dramatized in great annual public ceremonies and harvest festivals like the famous Ajuira festival of the Akan kingdom of Ashanti that I write about in the book in present-day Ghana. In these highly choreographed and dramatic moments, power was often on public display for all to see. At other times, like the ritual anointment we didn't see of Charles III, it was hidden away. The fringed beaded crowns covering the faces of the sacred Yoruba kings in present-day southwestern Nigeria is a very good example of this signifying the concealed, mystical nature of royal power. Either way, where the power was publicly performed in an expressive and performative way, or hidden away, African dynastic rulers, as I write about Ashanti, were masterful performers of power. 
And from that performance of power has arisen much of the artistic production, the material culture, and the music, which I think are one of Africa's great glories and legacies for uh, the world's people. These qualities were reinforced by the fact that ruling dynasties were often themselves seen as strangers who had come from another place. These myths of origin were enshrined in so-called founding charters that were in turn preserved in oral traditions, coming back to the point I made about the importance of thinking about how it is exactly that we, we reconstruct and interpret uh, these deep histories, oral traditions, and the use of them is an important part of this process. This essential sacredness also shaped the spatial configuration of kingdoms, many of which appear to have been characterized by a central core within which political uh, power was firmly exercised, but surrounded by a wider, fluid periphery, beyond which it was ritual power, to go back to the point I made earlier, which held sway. In other words, what kingdoms looked like in the eyes of their own populations and also on, in the eyes of the scholars who tried to interpret them often depended on where the kingdoms were viewed from. The Roman Empire looked very different from Rome than it did from far peripheral areas of it like Syria, North Africa or York. And so depending on where you sit in any state configuration depends on the nature of that, of how that state works and looks. So it's the job, I think, of historians to think about how people in the past viewed polities in strikingly different ways. This is not to say that African kings and queens did not did not develop other forms of hard power more recognizable from European or Asian history. Wealth generated from agricultural production, from trade, from taxation or tribute, from enslavement, from military technology, uh, led to often sophisticated forms of governance, so-called instrumental power, as opposed to what we could call creative power. And it's the tension over time between those two forms of power that I think emerges as a key theme from the chapters of, of, of the book. Change over time, of course, is important here in weighing this balance. As Romane Idrissa uh, writes on the sequence of states, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai in the West African Sahel, military violence was certainly used to extend and maintain the power of the great medieval empires between the 8th and the 16th centuries. But from the 16th and 17th century, we can see a real watershed, I think, in African history. Increasing contacts with Europe through the development of the transatlantic slave trade seems to have marked a new, we could call it, with some reservations, modern era of state building in Africa, characterized by increasing violence and predation. Firearms, enslavement, new sources of wealth, underpinned the rise of more, much more militarized expansionist kingdoms, such as Oyo, Ashanti, Dahomey, and Segu in West Africa, and also kingdoms like Uganda in East Africa. This more militarized state building continued into the 19th century, as we can see with the examples of Sokoto and the Zulu, but then came up against a new and increasingly aggressive rival, European imperialism. With the exception, famously, of the Christian Kingdom of Ethiopia, African states lost the resulting military regional struggles for power in what became commonly known as the scramble for Africa at the end of the 19th century. Africa's great kingdoms were subsumed into colonial states, the point at which most of the chapters in the book wrap up and then into the post-colonial states that succeeded them. But African kingdoms continue today to exert much influence and spiritual authority over uh, the people that live within them and around them.
And so the legacies of this very deep history over 5,000 years is a very important part of the African political landscape today. Thanks. Let me leave my introduction to that. I'll now have a see what uh, Daryl's picked up on that talk, and then, as I say, we'll, we'll be open for questions from you. That's lovely, but I think we need an interim applause, at least. So, thanks, John. You, you mentioned a, a recent coronation in London. Um, and I think we've long recognised that terms like king and queen and kingdom, they, they, for many of us, they come with this kind of Eurocentric baggage, right? We think we understand what a kingdom is. Um, do you think that's a problem for people trying to understand kingdoms in Africa? Do you think we, 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 we project European ideas onto them? Yes, I think that is a problem. Um, it comes actually back to my very first point about my unease with the terminology of great empires, great kingdoms, uh, because these terms often do not exactly fit the realities of other peoples. And I think part of what the book tries to argue is that, as I said, African kingdoms need to be thought about in a comparative perspective, but they need to be looked at on their own terms, and those terms are often very different from what, from what we sort of think we know about how kingdoms functioned, particularly in terms of this notion of, of the importance of mystical, we could call it vaguely supernatural power as opposed to the, the sort of hard power of, of military uh, coercion and, and, and state building. So it is a problem, but I still think that, 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 that um, the evidence suggests that, that the terms kings, queens, kingdoms, kingship can, can be used you know, with, with reservation and with qualification where needed. But the the, the, the use of vernacular language and thinking about the way power worked is important and, and the authors in the book often dwell on the, the particular dynamics of those many vernacular languages. No, brilliant. And, and I can't relate it to that really. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of kingdoms in the book that, that are described as by the authors as constitutional monarchies. So I'm thinking of Yoruba and, and Congo. And you were mentioning in your talk this idea of coercion versus consent. I mean, do you, do you, are you surprised when talking to audience who are less familiar with African history that the people express surprise, I mean, that uh, the constitutional monarchies existed in the deep past in Africa? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd quite describe the African situation as, as constitutional, um, but it's certainly the case that uh, the power worked in, in, in ways that often involved very complex forms of checks and balances that, that, that sought to limit the, the powers that King had. So King's had. So going back to, to David Wengrow's quote that I, that I um, mentioned, that the history of kingship is, off, is not just about kings, it's about how people tried to control kings. Kings can be bothersome people. And of course, I don't have to tell a, an audience in York that kings are not always necessarily good kings. There's bad ones too, although, you know, historical revision is, is ongoing about some of the, the so-called bad kings of English history. But, um, so, th there's this general sort of idea, I think, in the history of many parts of the world that states are good things to live in. And, and, and a good way of running states in the past was often seen to be, to be that they should be run by, by dynastic rulers, by kings and queens. I think that's, now, historians are now looking at that and thinking, well, that may have been the case sometimes, but it often wasn't the case. As, as I said, one of those key themes of the book was many people struggled throughout history in many ways to avoid being ruled by kings and not necessarily to rule them. And even when they were, there was often a lot of power left in, or authority left in society by which kings in their bothersome, strange, to use that term, ways, mystical ways, could be controlled. <laughs> 
So, yes, I mean, I think, again, it's, it comes back to this idea of terminology, but constitutional uh, rule which suggests kings reign but do not necessarily rule mm -hmm. uh, is, is, a, is a, 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 a reasonably valid way of, of, of looking at the situation. No, I, I, I tend to agree. And I think one of the things that struck me that, that I think you mentioned a couple of times, it was mentioned in the introduction, and I saw it in a couple of chapters as well. I guess, again, coming back to this, you know, our, our European ideas of, of kingdoms and states, and we tend to think of them as having very fixed borders. Um, this is an idea that, of course, the colonial period in Africa has imposed on the post-independent states. But you raise a few examples where the borders are basically very permeable. And I liked your argument about low population densities where people could choose to, if they didn't want to be ruled by a particular kingdom, to just leave. Or other states where they acted as a, as, a, as a basin of attraction, if you like, where people moved into states or into kingdoms because they could see the benefits of living in them. And do you think that forces us to rethink what we mean by a state? Can we think in terms of states with very fluid borders? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. The, uh, our general perceptions of states are, are often from what we know about European history, and European kingship was largely forged in the, the feudal age of the medieval period, when, when enclosing people and fixing them to land was all important. Now, of course, in the feudal system, kings and uh, dynastic families devolved power to the, the lords of the land, but, and they were liege to them. But the African situation over deep time is, was a very different one. Historically, Africa, uh, despite the notion of it now as, as experiencing a great wave of, of population increase, historically it was very underpopulated with, and all state systems had effectively open borders. And so the ways of imposing uh, control over these situations of open borders with only limited technology, or that is to say technology controlled by the ruling elites that weren't considerably different from technology controlled by ordinary people, had to be quite um, imaginative. Mm -hmm. And so one of, the, one of the imaginative ways that African uh, ruling dynasties came to assert that authority and power was not to try to do it with, with hard power, but to do it with, with, with what could be described as soft power, with the, 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 the creative or mystical power that I've talked about. So peripheral areas were, were drawn to, uh, didn't, often did not have power, military power imposed on them, but were drawn to the kind of civilizing ethos of these royal courts. So the royal courts and the culture that they sought to, to control and to hand out for um, for loyalty was important. And of course, this comes back to the point I made about the importance of artistic production, of, of royal, uh, royal art, of music, of these great staged uh, yearly um, uh, festivals where power was, was celebrated and, and, and projected. So yes, I mean, the open borders and the, the difference between that core uh, area and the outlying area is, is a recurring theme across much of the continent's history. Mm -hmm. I, 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 there are a couple of great examples, and, and perhaps you can give us um, some details um, of uh, kings holding very large um, areas of land that are cultivated, not for them to uh, not to enrich themselves, but so that they have a stock of food that can be distributed out. Um, and, and that's just another way, isn't it, in a, in a sense, as you say, a, cre a creative way of attracting people into a, into a state. Yeah, this comes back, back to that tension, that, that, that question I pose, what, what are kings? Are they essentially um, uh, coercive or are they essentially, do they rule in, in, in different non-coercive ways? Again, we have this notion that kings accumulated power and, of, and could use it in very hard-headed ways if they needed to do so. But many of our African case studies from the past suggest that um, kings weren't fabulously wealthy. Some were. The kings of Ashanti and other states were fabulously wealthy. They controlled a large part of the world's gold trade. But for many others, kingship and queenship was an expensive business because to maintain that power with only limited technological 
advantages over the people you're trying to rule. You, you're not, you don't have, you shouldn't be taking, you have to give. Mm -hmm. And so that's absolutely right. That, and again, the, the essence of these great yearly um, uh, displays of power, like the Ajwira festival and the Shanti in present day Ghana, for example, was very much about giving. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, there's, there's a, several um, policies that you discuss that I guess we could describe as multi-ethnic states and it's something that modern states, we don't have to look very far to see that modern states still struggle with this. Um, do you think that, that these multi-ethnic, that the, the tensions between communities always played a role in African kingdoms or do you think there's something we can learn from the way that African kingdoms manage these multi-community, multi-ethnic states? Yeah, I, I think there is, and, and by that we, I think that can include the um, holders of power in contemporary Africa, not just people from beyond Africa. Pre-colonial African states, to use that term I'm not particularly happy with, but I'll, I'll chuck it out there, were often far more effective in creating um, consensus amongst different peoples than contemporary African rulers are. And we only have to look at the recent example of Sudan, but other, other countries in, 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 uh, across, um, across uh, Africa, south of the Sahara, from Senegal in the west right through to Sudan and Somalia in the east, which is, we've seen recurring levels of violence in the last 10 or 20 years to see that many of those deep traditions of of a more consensual form of state building have unfortunately been lost. They've been preserved in some areas, but it's where they've been lost that we see these recurring <coughs> forms of violence that, that are not always about competing ethnicities, but in some cases very much are. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, the various case studies in the book, I think, of uh, uh, have some very interesting things to say about that, about that tension between coercion on the one hand and consensus on the other. Yeah, but I think there's also, it's, it's now fairly well understood, isn't it, that, that's, uh, that the European colonial powers arriving in the 19th century and into the 20th century had a tendency to, to go and talk to community and say, right, you are, you are now the go-go or you are the Akan or whatever, and, and you live in this place and you have this particular form of, um, of subsistence practice, you're, a, you're an agriculturalist or you're a pastoralist or whatever. And I think you've got case studies here where people, that, that is a much more fluid idea before the Europeans entrench it. Yeah. This book is about Africa's deep history. As I said when I introduced it, it, it does not extend in any sustained way into the period of European colonial rule and beyond, so about the last hundred years or so. But the coming of European imperialism was important, just exactly as you say, because European incoming European colonial rulers often dictated the, came to dictate the terms of how the past was seen. And it's one of the, it, it's a key sort of what we could call a methodological problem about looking at the deeper African past, that African slave traders, African, uh, European slave traders, sorry, uh, explorers, missionaries, uh, 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 adventurers and state builders and invaders in the 19th century were all drawn to African kings. They want, they look, they all looked for people who they could either, they could do business with whatever their business was, whether it was purchasing enslaved people to take to the Americas or to, uh, to find uh, allies in imposing colonial power in the late 19th century. So this has created a kind of problem for historians because, uh, because kings are important, obviously that's what we're talking about tonight, but they might not have been quite as important as was indeed the case in the deeper past because our, the, the written sources that we have to reconstruct these histories have an awful lot to say about kings, but they have a lot less to say about the people beyond uh, the direct um, realm of kingship on the peripheries and between these state systems that I mentioned before. And it's not just a matter of European sources. The oral traditions I mentioned in passing earlier also tend to amplify 
royal power. So this comes back to that very first point I made about my, my slight unease with sort of focusing on kingdoms because the, the, the thrust for historians recently has not been to look at kings but has been to look at those people who have, have, have tried to forge smaller scale, more egalitarian political systems beyond, beyond the power of kings. But that tension, I think, is there and needs to be further thought about. Mm -hmm. So let's move away from kings then with this kind of masculine idea of kings. Um, there's some fascinating examples here where women play key roles in, in government and I, I, I personally knew nothing about the, the god's wife of Amun uh, in the Nubian period of, um, of uh, the Egyptian state and of course you've got matrilineal um, uh, kingly ascent in, in Akan so it's it's still a male that takes that role, but it, the, 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 the authority of that is passed down the female line. Um, do you think this is something that needs to be um, better understood about these African polities and is something that should be celebrated? Yes, uh, it, it, it is. Um, across the historical discipline and, and other disciplines, of course, in the last generation or two, gender has come to play an increasingly important role. Historians very belatedly woke up to the fact that the history they were writing was often effectively the history of men, often powerful men, often powerful white men. And women were often left out of the story at all levels of society and, and the political spectrum. Uh, most dynastic rulers in African history, as in other parts of the world, were men. Uh, but some important ones were women. Uh, and David Wenger, going right back to the the earliest phases of dynastic rule in Egypt and, and Nubia uh, 5,000 years ago talks about how the gender dynamics of power were, uh, now seem to be very important with, with women playing uh, and young unmarried women also. He writes about these, these uh, wives and women that you mentioned playing an increasingly important role. Many societies in Africa were not patrilineal, they were matrilineal. By that, I mean that succession and inheritance passed through the female line, not the male line. Now, that did not mean that, that those societies had queens. What it meant was that the sons of kings were not eligible to become kings in their wake. It would be their nephews, to use the, Euro the, the European concept, the sons of their sisters. So, but... The sister herself, in the, in the Akan example in present-day Ghana, is, is a good one, uh, held considerable power, particularly at points of transition. Mm -hmm. The death of one ruler and the, the anointing, of the mystical anointing of the other, as we saw a month ago, is an absolutely key moment where ideas about kingship uh, and, and dynastic rule are thrown up. And certainly, watching the coronation on on um, television, I was uh, I was thinking, well, yes, I mean, this this really speaks to what, what I've what I've just been writing about. I mean, it was peculiar. Mm. I, it, it, I mean, I, I we all know that the 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 the, um, the head of this state is, is is also the head of the of the state church of the Anglican Church. But just the sheer high churchness of Charles's coronation was striking. It was an entirely religious uh, three hours. There was no secular element in it whatsoever. It was run and uh, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and 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 that that made me think about the way kingship works in Africa too. Uh, it's those mystical qualities that that that, that were, were brought to the fore. Mm. So again, you know, the comparative perspective is interesting. No, absolutely. And having having started by saying, do we need to, uh, you know, do we need to drag ourselves away from this Eurocentric idea of kingdom? It's interesting that you come back to actually there are themes, there are um, yeah. elements of yeah. power that we see in the European kingdoms and in in African kingdoms. Yeah, I mean th 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 that's an important point. Don't get me wrong. As I said. African history, African kingdoms, all facets of the African past need to be considered on their own terms. But once that's done, 
to bring them in conversation with the histories of other parts of the world is a very fruitful uh, experience. Um, Africa often has been left out of global histories, and particularly with the rise of so-called global or world history in the last sort of 20 years or so, Africa is often very much marginalized, and so a new generation of scholars, often, often younger African scholars, are now struggling to bring Africa into that comparative perspective. No, it's brilliant, and that's where you started, was it, saying that one of the aims of the book was to have chapters written by young African scholars. Brilliant. So on that note, I think I'd love to open up to uh, questions from the room. And uh, straight away, there's a hand right at the back. So you send your hand up. Uh, a, a, a willing assistant will run up the stairs. Thank you very much. You, you touched on, but didn't really elaborate, on the uh, about slavery in the context of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, anyway, uh, before the Europeans became involved. So could you tell us a little bit more about existing slavery and the impact of the Europeans on the slave trade? Thanks. Yeah, that, thanks. That, that's a, 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 a massive question, which we, we could spend the rest of the evening talking about. It's a, it's a very good one. Um, Slavery, uh, ensl the enslavement of peoples existed in various forms uh, in all parts of the world, uh, Africa, Europe, Asia, um, uh, the Middle East, even the Pacific Islands, uh, the Americas, uh, and um, uh, Africa, of course, was, was no exception. But the, for the, the forging of the transatlantic slave trade uh, was very much a watershed in that um, process, in, in that long history, by which um, existing forms of servitude and social hierarchy in Africa were reshaped to fuel this nexus of exploitation in the in the Atlantic world, and um, so. Historians have spent generations now thinking about how exactly the coming of the, the European-run transatlantic slave trade impacted not just on the creation of uh, African diasporas in the Americas and on the emergence of capitalism uh, fueled by it, but also within Africa itself. And the evidence seems to suggest that what did happen, and I touched on this in passing, and thank you for asking me to elaborate on it, was that that process deepened the levels of exploitation within Africa itself. And so some of these more militaristic and, and uh, military expansionist and, and, and exploitative uh, states wielding much harder forms of power, including European firearms, which they often bought in exchange for enslaved captives, um, uh, led to this, fed into this new wave of more aggressive state building that I mentioned from uh, the, set the 16th, 17th, and into the 18th century and beyond. So, um, so slavery, enslavement changed within Africa. The transatlantic slave trade transformed those parts of Western Central Africa would it impacted on, in, just as it, of course, had a massive impact on the histories of the Americas, the Caribbean, and, and Europe too. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a fascinating example on the chapter of the Kingdom of Congo, where the, the King of Congo, is it uh, Afonso, writes to, back to Portugal, and is it to the King or to the Ambassador, say, complaining that Portuguese uh, are capturing and, and enslaving people that he regards as free men in Congo. They are free-born men, they should not be treated as, as uh, slaves, whereas by, uh, by extension clearly there are people that he regards as, uh, as legitimate prey to the enslavers. And it, it's a fascinating moment to see an African king writing back to, yeah. to Europe in the hope that he has the authority to complain and that, that, that his complaint will be dealt with. Yeah. And it's, it's also interesting in that case study that the Portuguese king, Alfonso, uh, was writing in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, um, uh, sorry, the Congolese king, Alfonso, was writing in Portuguese. Congo, which is situated at the mouth of the Congo River in present-day northern Angola and the uh, uh, westernmost part of uh, 
Democratic Republic of Congo is a fascinating case study because within decades of its encountering Portuguese navigators in the 1480s, the ruling elite effectively had converted to Catholicism. And uh, with it, of course, literacy, writing in European languages, and engaging with this emerging Black Atlantic world of the of the Atlantic. Um, and so, uh, we often think of in Africa, south of the Sahara, as Ethiopia being a unique Christian kingdom. But from the from about 1500, Congo was also ruled by. African Christian kings mm -hmm. who were, were, were debating these issues about the slave trade, as you say, on very much on an equal footing and, and uh, with, with their European um, allies. And in some ways, on more than an equal footing, because they, of course, controlled access to mm -hmm. the commodity that Europeans wanted, which was uh, horrifically to think of human mm -hmm. labor. Amazing. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the floor? Uh, a couple from the, the gentleman on the, in the suit there. On the, hi. Thank you. Just a microphone's on its way. Thanks very much. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of times about the oral tradition, and I, I'm just interested in this point you made right at the beginning about the deep history of Africa and the availability of sources. And what are the kind of sources that are available to historians, and how do historians deal with the oral tradition in particular? Uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, th this is of absolute crucial importance because Africa, those thinking about the history of the African past face, face many problems, but face one fundamental problem, which is that a great many societies and states in, the, in Africa south of the Sahara were non-literate. Writing uh, uh, and reading only uh, began to develop in the modern period and often in the, in the very modern period. Um, more is known about the daily life of uh, Egyptians in the old kingdom of Egypt four and a half thousand years ago than is known about uh, daily life among some African societies in around about 1900, four and a half thousand years later. So for historians, right from the emergence of African history as a serious scholarly discipline in the 1950s and 60s, oral traditions were a way of circumventing that problem of written sources. Because when written sources did emerge, they were often written by Europeans. Not always. Very important African literate, new literate elites in many parts of Africa, Uganda being uh, a, an important example in East Africa, began producing written sources quite early. But many of these writ early written sources were the oral traditions being written down for the first time. So oral traditions are accessible in, one of, in, in, in two ways. One is to, to still hear them being spoken today, and many still are spoken today and sung today, for example, by the famous griots, the musicians of, of, of West Africa, who still today sing, often with electrical instrumentation, the, sto the great story of the founding of the Mali Empire by the warrior king Sunjata Keita. But the other way of, um, of accessing oral traditions is that they were often, they began to be, uh, to be written down from sort of the middle to the late 19th century and beyond. So um, in terms of, to use a phrase that's, that's very current now, in terms of decolonizing the past, oral traditions were, were absolutely crucial. But of course, oral traditions have, their, have very particular problems um, of interpretation, because like in all parts of the world, oral history bleeds into mythology, and the, the what is mythology and what is history, of course, is often in the eye of the beholder. Um, what sort of rational post-enlightenment Europeans might think of as simply as myth, African peoples often 
think of as holding very deep and profound social truth. So, so, the, so histo historians like me spend an awful lot of time poring over and thinking about the nature of these, of these crucial sources and what they might tell us about the past. We used to think as well, didn't we, that, that oral histories are fundamentally different from, written, from histories that are written down because we have this idea of permanence with a written source. And yet every generation decides what it's going to keep in terms of that written record. And it's the same in a way with that, with that oral tradition. Right? Every generation decides which bit of that they're going to keep and which bit they're going to adapt and which bit they're going to discard. That's right. I mean, the, as one dynasty succeeded another in China, the history that it, the written history of the previous dynasty was traditionally completely destroyed mm -hmm. and was started again from year one. I mean, some of those some of those written records continued, but there was a policy that it would start from scratch. We see the same things in pharaonic Egypt. Anyone who's been to Egypt and to Luxor or Giza and looked at the 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 uh, the remain the physical remains of pharaonic civilization will see the cartouches and the, the hieroglyphic writings with parts scratched out. This is often a form of, of, of censoring of the past. Yeah, no, and so, so it's not just oral traditions that are problematic. Written, written sources also uh, you know, need very careful interpretation. Yeah, that's a very good point. There was a question, I think, that Brilliant, thank you. Um, to what extent did the uh, sort of positive, mystical, soft rulership of African di um, dynastic rulers, rather than the more strongly militaristic one, um, make African societies more susceptible to the later European influence? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's excellent. Um, I think that a short answer is that it, in some cases, yes, it did. That very much depended on uh, on particular p political configurations and situations in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, I, I concluded my part of the talk by saying that African ruling elites effectively lost a race for power against a much more aggressive expansionist and 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 better armed European uh, imperial rivals. And I think the, the, the fact that many African state systems were much, uh, were, were focused on the functioning of soft power clearly made them less able to stand up to, um, to these European invaders. I mean, there's, there's, many, there's many sources from different parts of the continent uh, with, with, with uh, African the African adversaries of incoming European conquerors simply, simply dumbfounded at the at the the extent with which the European and their African, often African soldiers, were you know in, engaged in in highly violent acts of conquest. You know, going against the sort of culture of of uh, of military engagement that often went back uh, generations and centuries. Um, that, that, the, the, again, it's the European observers from outside the continent, and this is partly a product of imperialism and, and, and racist colonial rule, had you know, portrayed Africa as a particularly violent, lawless um, uh, place that needed the imposition of European power uh, to keep it under control. Um, uh, but that was a, that was a, 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 a myth generated by uh, European uh, rulers who, who felt that their civilization was superior to that of Africans. In fact, many African states um, uh, ruled through the exercise of mystical, uh, soft forms of power and um, were, were, were singularly unequipped to rise to this aggressive challenge at the end of the 19th century, which is one reason why Africa was conquered so swiftly, uh, really in the 1880s and the 1890s. So that, yeah, that's that's an excellent uh, line of investigation that I think historians of the continent will continue to explore in the future. Right. Any further questions? So we have someone right at the back there. I'm afraid you're just a silhouette because I have the lights in my eyes, but uh, microphone's on the way. 
Um, thank you. A very interesting talk. Uh, so you said that in various kingdoms in Africa, the power was passed down through the matriarchal line. So two aspects that I would like to ask you about. The first is uh, if this was stable in the sense that I can imagine conflict in the family, for example, between cousins. And the second is uh, if uh, this helped with equality between uh, men and women in those societies. Th thanks for that question. Yeah, so gender, the, the gender dynamics of the African past. Yes, I mean, not, all, not everywhere, but, but a great many uh, regions of the continent had uh, matrilineal forms of succession and social structure, to use that anthropological term. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, one, one feature of dynastic rule that generally African kingdoms failed to solve was succession. Because as you very rightly suggest, the numbers of successors was often massive. Those eligible to succeed a dead king were often, it could be numbered often in the hundreds. They were all, all people uh, of, uh, of, of, from various lines of royal descent, and sometimes beyond. And the, the, the chapter in the book on Congo explores this in a very interesting way, as does the, the chapter on Buganda. And so moments of succession, as of course they used to be in English and other parts of European history, were often highly contested. Um, so they, that often did lead to violence with some often... Uh, with forms of counter-violence that were, 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 were imposed in efforts to control them. So, for example, in, in 18th and 19th century Buganda, one of the, the, a succession of kings had an idea of, to control this violence, which was to physically eliminate all the potential candidates for the kingship, with the exception of, of, of a very small number of, of favoured candidates. Uh, or to, and in Ethiopia, the same system, all the other rival candidates were locked up in a great fortress on the top of an Ethiopian mountain on Amba and, um, and were imprisoned there for life. Um, so, again, as I said before, um, without wanting to sound too facetious, dynastic rulers are strange beasts and dynastic families are strange. They do a number of key things. One is that they exercise different forms of power. But the other thing ruling families do and are obsessed with in all parts of the world is to reproduce themselves. And you only have to read the tabloid newspapers in Britain to know that the reproduction of the royal line is a matter of great uh, concern. And this was the case in, in African history too. So, so royal courts... Are, important, are interesting, fascinating, and important places, often sitting at the center of these royal cities. And the cities often were effectively the court. And so, um, so yes, the, 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 the kind of intrigue, um, uh, rivalry, uh, gender dynamics, um, murderous uh, violence, fratricidal violence that we know all too well from the history of, of, of England, uh, has also been a part of the African past too. It goes back to my very first point about how great these kingdoms were. Um, are kingdoms great? I mean, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that they're often not so great um, in terms of their treatment of themselves, let alone the people that they have pretensions to rule over. So even though I compromised in a way and ended up with that title of the book, the emphasis, my, my intent was not to think about how great any particular state system was, but to think about how important it was and how, and the important things it has to tell us. And I hope that the, I hope that the book has you know, succeeded in, in doing that. No, I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, but I'm just going to pick you up on the second part of your question, which is about gender equality, if I'm right. And did you think that the matrilineal societies, is that, did that 
if I'm, uh, I'm interpreting your question for you, but does that lead to more um, gender equality? Yes, yeah, sorry, no, you're quite, thanks, Daryl. You, you did mention the question of, 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 of gender equality. Um, that's a tough one. Yes and no. Um, and it often depended on where in the social spectrum women um, uh, sat. Elite, powerful women often were very important political actors. So the role, the, the office of queen mother in various vernacular African languages was a very important one. The Akan uh, states of present-day Ghana, the that many of the states of the Great Lakes regions like Buganda had this role of, of queen mother. And in fact, uh, it's recently been realized that the notion of Kabaka, for example, the, the king of Buganda, was not just one person. The, the, the notion of Kabaka hood actually extended to three people. Mm -hmm. The king himself, his most important sister, the royal sister, and the queen mother. And together, those three people, two of whom were by definition were, were, were women, uh, but shared power in, in many ways. But further down the spectrum, that wasn't necessarily the case. Of course, these days, we're thinking less and less in terms of a dichotomized gender hierarchy of male and female, but, the inter but, but more of a spectrum of gender uh, identities, wh which is much more fluid. And interestingly, this can be seen as a feature of the African past too, because some, in some areas where women actually took the reins of power and became queens, they were recategorized as men. Mm -hmm. They were women kings. And that, it, it, again, it comes back to this point of rulers being often quite strange. They were no longer precisely women. They were something a little bit different, just in the way that a king or a queen is not precisely a regular person. They attain other forms, of other mystical qualities. So, very good multi, um, multi-part question with all sorts of interesting issues, I think, and to the way, uh, which, and also which point, again, uh, like the question from over here, point in, in the direction of what, of, of what a lot of current research, uh, is, uh, where a lot of current research is going. No, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, as, um, as my students will tell you, I'm dreadful at ending things on time, um, but I should. I get carried away with conversations. We are out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank John again uh, for uh, his talk and thank you all for your um, excellent questions. So thank you. <laughs>